Welcome, everyone. We are going to get started now. So my name is Pam Morgan, and I'm going to be one of your hosts for today's event, Exposing Forever Chemicals, PFAS Contamination in Maine, in which three experts will examine how PFAS are affecting human health, explore solutions for decreasing exposure to toxic chemicals in the environment, and learn about multiple approaches to solving a human environment health issue. So I'm a professor of environmental studies here in the School of Marine and Environmental Programs, and the reason why we're here today is because this past January, I attended a panel discussion that was held in a town hall in Arundel, which is a town just down the road from UNE. And so I had been hearing about PFAS in the news, and I wanted to understand more about them. I was surprised to see so many people there when I walked in at 9.30 on a Saturday morning. And it turns out, though, that Fred Stone, who owns a dairy farm right in Arundel, had discovered very high levels of PFAS chemicals in his cow's milk, his farm's soil, and his drinking water. The chemicals had come from wastewater sludge, which he had been spreading on his fields as a fertilizer. The state of Maine had encouraged farmers to spread the sludge-based fertilizer onto their fields, not knowing that it contained dangerous chemicals. As I sat and listened to the panel speakers, one of them was Fred, who is actually here today, I thought that this is an issue that the UNE community should know about. Here at UNE, we have students who study in the health fields, and we have students who study in the environmental fields, and this topic really brings those two together. Plus, I just wanted more people to be aware of this issue, to learn what they could do about the problem. And I couldn't help but think of Rachel Carson, who wrote the book Silent Spring, many years ago, before most of you in this room were born. Her book documented the harmful effects of toxic chemicals on people and the environment way back in 1962. And as she pointed out, we are often unaware of the harmful chemicals in the environment around us. We hope that through this presentation and the Q&A that will follow the presentation, you'll be able to learn more about PFAS, their effects, and what we can do to deal with the situation that we're in. We actually hope that this might be the first of a series of discussions on this topic, so stay tuned for part two, hopefully next fall. Now I'm going to turn the podium over to my co-host, Alethea Caridi, who runs the sustainability program at UNE. And it's thanks to Alethea that we're having this program this afternoon because she's the person I turned to after I had uh, listened to the first panel discussion, and she was all enthused about trying to bring this to UNE this semester and not wait till the fall because it's such a timely issue. So I'm going to thank Alethea for all her hard work in bringing the event, and she's going to introduce our speakers for today. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome, and thank you, Pam. Um, so I just wanted to take a quick moment to thank our partners, um, the Sustainability Office, um, our student environmental club, Earth's Eco, who's sponsoring um, tonight's event, as well as the School of Marine and Environmental Programs. And we certainly couldn't do it without the help um, for promotion from the Center of Excellence and Collaborative Education and our communications team. So all of these entities and other groups at UNE are actively working to strengthen connections between our robust environmental sciences and the health profession programs here, and to provide planetary health content through academics, research, and events like this one. <clears throat> um, a note to our students, uh, this event is, will address interprofessional competencies competencies of values and ethics and roles and responsibilities, and can be applied towards UNE students interprofessional honors distinction. So please be sure to complete the attendance survey at the end of the presentation um, for that. So to start today's program, I'm gonna just, 
Um, I'm, I'm briefly going to introduce our speakers and then I'm going to turn it over to the panelists who will give their presentations. And then lastly, we're going to provide ample time for audience participation and discussion. So I'm really hoping that, um, that you'll ask questions and um, we are really interested in hearing your thoughts. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our speakers. Um, our first panelist is Davis Martinek, a North Carolina native. Davis comes to University of New England as an organic chemist and environmental advocate. An, an immediate interest of PFAS was sparked when the news broke in 2017 that DuPont had been knowingly poisoning the Cape Fear River with Gen X in Wilmington, North Carolina. Now out of the laboratory, Davis enjoys applying his chemistry background to improve science literacy and science communication. Davis enjoys all the activities the Four Seasons of Maine has to offer with his partner, Ellie, and their cattle dog, Fox. And then our second pa panelist will be Dr. Paul Siegel. Paul is a native New Englander, um, former academic internist and nephrologist who returned to Maine in 2018 and practiced primary care and nephrology in Southern Maine. Currently, he teaches at UNE College of Osteopathic Medicine, where he course co-directs students in medical knowledge and leads the interprofessional education curriculum. And then finally, our third panelist will be Sarah Woodbury. As Director of Advocacy, Sarah spearheads Defend Our Health's advocacy and coalition work. She works closely with legislators, coalition partners, and supporters to advance Defend's mission of fighting for safe food, safe drinking water, healthy homes, and toxic-free, climate-friendly products. Sarah brings with her over 14 years of experience in the advocacy and communications realms. Um, Sarah has an MA in Applied Politics from American University and a BS in Political Science from Portland State University. And then finally, I just want to thank Jasmine Bouchard and Virginia May, um, who have graciously agreed to moderate the discussion after the panel presentations. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to our first panelist, Davis. Thank you for the introduction, Alethea. Hi, everyone. I'm Davis. So um, I'm going to present one perspective of three today. This is going to be the perspective of a chemist, an environmental advocate, and somebody who sees this as a huge problem. I'm sure you guys do as well. Um, PFAS represent a multifaceted problem. They're huge, the scope is large, and it means that the solution needs to be multifaceted and the, and the solution needs to be large as well. It's also going to require cooperation. Um, Sorry, I should read my notes here. That's a point I wanted to make. Um, each of you comes from a different background. Each of you has had different experiences, is studying different subjects, and each of you has, um, has, in, per, has perspectives that you can provide to the solution of PFAS. Um, the most important thing I think that you guys can do, um, though, is to be informed. And, I'm grateful that you guys are all here. I'm thankful that you guys are all here learning about this issue because it's a really important issue. Um, my goal today is that you leave here with an increased understanding of what PFAS are, where they are, and why this problem is so large that it can't be ignored. Um, starting off with hydrocarbons. These are super common molecules. Everybody here has interacted with a hydrocarbon, whether you believe it or not. They, they heat our homes, power our cars, and keep the lights on. They also were the original you know, lubricants that we used back in the industrial days. These are also biological surfactants. And what I've shown here, the rotating molecule, is methane. This is one of the simplest or the simplest hydrocarbon. It's a central carbon atom with four hydrogen atoms bound to it, right? So in the late 19th century, scientists started exploring uses for these and 
trying to make them more chemically diverse to solve issues at the time. A large issue at this time was refrigeration. And so what they discovered was that chlorofluorocarbons, which is a carbon atom that's had hydrogens replaced with chlorine atoms and fluorine atoms, had wonderful properties as a refrigerant. Low boiling points and um, they weren't flammable like hydrocarbons are. The problem with these is that the chlorine-hydrogen bond is relatively weak. It's, it's not great. And when these were used as propellants and they were used as refrigerants, these got into the environment, they were released, and in the atmosphere, this interacts with sunlight. The carbon-fluorine bond is broken by sunlight, and that free chlorine atom then goes on to degrade ozone. Most of us here, myself included, are too young to remember the ozone issue over the Antarctic back in the 80s and 90s. But um, nonetheless, uh, I, w I think it's important to bring up because th there was unparalleled global cooperation to solve this issue. And it was a growing issue at the time, but they came together. We banned these, this entire class, actually. Not just specific ones, but an entire class of molecules. And um, we managed to divert a global disaster. And I think that we can take lessons from that um, when dealing with the PFAS issue. So how does the state of Maine define PFAS? Well, they define it as any kind of carbon atom that's had all of its hydrogens replaced by fluorines. It's pretty boring, but that's what it is, and it's important to know that. Now, a couple caveats. You guys may have heard of the term perfluoro and polyfluoro, and they sound similar, but there's a slight difference. When you're dealing with something called a per polyfluoroalkyl substance, this has had all of its hydrogens replaced by fluorine except for one, and that's a chink in the armor. I want you to keep, in, keep a pin in that. A perfluoroalkyl substance is something that's had every single one of its hydrogen atoms replaced by a fluorine atom. So here, we see the polyfluorocarbon here. Um, white atom on top is a hydrogen, right? Everything else in green, that's a fluorine atom. So this would represent a polyfluorocarbon, right? These are the original the original um, fluoro, fluoroalkyl substances that scientists managed to release and apply um, to various applications. These were great, except that they degraded too quickly for the original uses, and that is because they had that one hydrogen atom there, and that's the chink in the armor. That's the point where you can start to react, you can start to do chemistries, and namely, you can start to degrade these molecules. Later on, um, they discovered how to completely fluorinate something. And so the perfluoroalkyl, um, perfluoroalkyl substances were created, discovered, and quickly applied. They were applied far and wide. So shifting gears, now that we kind of have an understanding of what these things look like, which I think is really important, is just to kind of visualize what some of these things look like. When we're talking about substances and pollutants in the environment, it's easy to kind of lose sight of what these things look like, um, and they're kind of just these nebulous, like, bad guys, right? So these are what I've dubbed the serious six. These are the ones that are the most commonly tested for, and they show up in all sorts of panels when you're doing soil and water, groundwater testing. And the two... The two main bad guys here are PFOS and PFOA, right? So that's perfluorooctane sulfonic acid and perfluorooctanoic acid. They sound very similar, they look very similar, and that's because they are very similar. But these are distinct molecules and they have distinct regulations for each of them. And I bring this up because it's easy to, um, to think that we could just ban certain chemicals and that would be in the end of it. But the reality is, is that these chemicals are just part of a really wide, large class. Each one, uh, its own chemical derivative, and each one behaving slightly differently, each, having, each exerting different effects on the environment and our bodies, um, and each one persisting for different amounts of time. So, what makes these useful? Um, well, the carbon-fluorine bond, I've spent a lot of time talking about the carbon-chlorine bond, but now we're going to switch to the carbon-fluorine bond. Carbon-fluorine bonds are extremely strong. They're unusually stable. And this has to do um, with the fact that they're slightly ionic, but that's a little bit beyond this here. I don't want to go too deep into the chemistry on it. But just understanding that this is a really strong bond is important. And the strength of that bond confers pretty much no re reactivity between these molecules. They don't want to react with things. They don't want to degrade. They don't want to interact with each other. And so this means that these molecules are um, 
both they they repel both water and oil. So they're hydrophobic and lipophobic. That means they're extremely useful. This is how you waterproof your raincoat and you keep oils from sticking to your shirts and your pants, all of those things. Um, so they're incredibly useful. Um, but I want to say that in their usefulness also lies their, their toxicity. It, it in lies the problem with these molecules is because they don't react. Um, so here, um, I've shown just PFOS, so the porphyrooctane sulfonic acid, right? And I've just rotated the molecule 180 degrees, just to, sh just to show you here. And this is an electrostatic potential map. This shows where there's relative charge on a molecule. Red indicates negativity, blue indicates positivity, and uh, kind of like a green, yellow indicates neutrality, right? Most of these molecules, or most of the entire molecule is neutral, indicating that Almost nowhere on this molecule are you going to be able to react anything, especially if you're attempting to degrade these things, um, if you're if you attempting to degrade in the environment by a microbe um, or by you know, various enzymes in our bodies. So just to kind of give you an idea of the scope of this, where do these things you know, show up in society? Where have they been applied? And um, this is just a small list, but uh, I figured, you know, Pretty much everybody in, in the audience here has probably interacted with one of these things. Just take a minute to look over this slide. So this is just a few, and I just want to point out that currently, um, one, one resource, the National Library of Medicine, lists over six million different PFAS chemicals. Those are just that are listed. There's others that we don't know about. There's others that are unnamed. There's others that are unreported. Um, and so that's just six million. And I think the news recently broke that uh, those serious six were the ones, some of the first that were going to get uh, nationally regulated. All right, so six out of six million. Keep that in mind. Because of their low reactivity, these are prime examples for uh, chemicals that are going to accumulate in the environment. They get out in the soils, they get out in groundwater, and nothing is able to degrade these. Not even our best chemists have figured out how to degrade these things. Um, and uh, one, one particular fact that uh, I found shocking when digging through some data was that in 2019, um, a uh, recent panel found uh, 27 parts per billion um, PPB of that uh, total, the total six, in a Biddeford grocery store's milk. The limit is 20 parts per trillion. So that's, that's you know, over several factors over the limit. And that's in, you know, the milk that you buy, it's not listed on the label. It's not anything you would know about. It's there. So... This is a map. Um, you can access this on Maine's uh, PFAS website. Just type in PFAS Maine, and you can come to this link. And this shows you all of the sites where contaminated material has been applied, has been utilized, as the state would say. Um, the little things, the little cones or cups with an S, that is, uh, I wrote this down here, a sludge utilization site, so that's going to be any kind of industrial solids, so that's wastewater treatment plant, paper mills, food processors, anything that generates some kind of solid, solid waste, whether it's biological, chemical, whatever. Um, they found a way to apply it because it does have some kind of... Um, some kind of use somewhere, you know, if it's uh, from a paper mill, they might be able to use that on farmland, whatnot. Um, it, you know, wastewater treatment plant obviously has organic solids in it that could be useful, but these things are also contaminated and they were spread around. Um, and then what kind of looks like a hamburger bun, those are septic utilization sites. And that's where, you know, if you have a septic tank and that gets pumped out, those solids have to go somewhere. And these were also distributed and applied to main farmlands and um, and uh, you can see that the, the, they're all over. They've been applied all over. And it's kind of, you know, going back to that slide of all the products that they're in, the fact that it's in the milk and it's been spread all over. These, it's a global issue, but Maine, you know, this particularly shows how bad it is in Maine and um, why, you know, why this is an issue that we need to solve now. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Paul. 
hopefully you guys uh, have a better understanding of what these things look like, where they are, and why it's a problem. Well, thank you. I, um, I'd like to thank Alethea for inviting me and the council. Uh, I would be remiss if I did not put a shout out to Fred Stone, you know, who has taught me more about PFAS than I ever knew in the beginning, and also a lot about animal husbandry. I learned a lot about animal husbandry through Fred, more than I ever learned in medical school. Uh, I'm going to shift gears and talk a little, little bit about forever chemicals, and I want you to think about this not in the sense from what Davis talked about in terms of the chemical aspect of things, but in terms of um, these chemicals are also labeled endocrine disrupting chemicals. And I'm, I want you to kind of keep that in mind as we go forward. <clears throat> so mine is a little bit less graphic than uh, Davis's, but you know, you can see that we get exposed to these chemicals in so many different fashions, you know, and it's, it's impossible to live anywhere within the state of Maine and not be exposed to these things on a regular basis. You know, that creates part of the problem and part of the rub in terms of how do we deal with these things from a, from a medical standpoint. Uh, these endocrine disrupting chemicals, what they do is they basically either disrupt, inhibit, block different chemical processes within our body, they can cross the placenta. So, and that's a really ominous type of prediction. And they cause disease. And the numbers of diseases that they cause, the unfortunate part is the causal relationships between these are not a linear fashion. Meaning that, you know, you take this chemical and it leads to disease number A or B or C. It really has to go through multiple chemical pathways. And that's the biggest challenge in terms of figuring out how to deal with these from a medical standpoint. Uh, there's a strong case that these things affect human health, you know, so we know that even low exposures and, you know, we set these levels, but we don't really know how to translate these levels into a condition or a disease. And they can induce all sorts of adverse health effects. Um, we have animal models that help us in terms of mice models, but it's really difficult to, to make that correlation between how an animal-based model affects a human being. But it at least gives us a model in terms of testing out some of these compounds and being able to figure out which uh, portions of the endocrine system they turn on and off. The unfortunate part is by virtue of the fact that they cross the placenta, they seem to interact with children at various parts, either in the early prenatal, the mid to late prenatal, or the postnatal period. And this, once again, has such an ominous viewpoint in terms of the creation of all these downstream diseases. I think one of the most fascinating things that I read in terms of preparing for this is from a Consumer Report article in 2022. And so what they did was, you know, in Consumer Reports tries to be obviously non-biased. What they did was they looked at multiple different restaurants and this link that I have over here, um, it doesn't project on there, but this link over here um, allows you to basically check other different types of restaurants, uh, inc including Trader Joe's, believe it or not. That's the one picture that's not on here. What they did was they were able to, to look at all these different um, places and figure out where PFOS and PFAS were located within their different products. And it's just, it's mind-blowing from that standpoint. And I really love that quote. You know, he said that trying to ban individual PFAS is an impossible game of a whack-a-mole. As soon as one is addressed, industry comes up with another. And as Davis mentioned, over six million that we know of to date. So how do these things cause associated health risks? Well, when you look at it from the standpoint, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna to have to turn this way because my, my head doesn't turn as well as it would like. But as you look at it from this standpoint, oops, I'm just gonna take this off there for a second. You know, you can see that this involves multiple different endocrinological types of disorders. Uh, the most fascinating thing, if you look in the literature, is the association between 
these forever chemicals or these um, uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals and metabolic diseases. That was one of my areas of interest. And um, there's a fairly good causal link between these chemicals and the development of not only obesity, but diabetes. And if you think about just the increasing prevalence of diabetes within the United States, so right now, roughly, there's about 5,600 new diabetics diagnosed every day. Uh, in the United States right now, diabetes, type 2 diabetes, makes up 11.3% of the United States population, presumed to increase over time. Um, in terms of the numbers, one out of 10 people in the United States have diabetes. One out of three has prediabetes, you know, kind of the forerunner to type 2 diabetes. And I was at a conference about a month ago, and the conference was on cardiometabolic health. And they were talking about the fact that by the year 2030, 60% of the United States population will be uh, obese and uh, that we'll see about a 50% increase in terms of type 2 diabetes. We will, in fact, um, it was uh, a pretty ominous prediction because the gentleman who was running this said that he predicts that we will not have enough primary care doctors to actually take care of the United States population by virtue of this. And one of the contributors are these forever chemicals. You know, um, not so much in a linear fashion, but in a pretty well drawn out type of fashion. Uh, the other thing that we're seeing, you know, in terms of these different specific diseases are uh, an accelerated uh, risk of cardiovascular disease. And the way we figure that it works is, you know, within your blood vessels, you have this layer called the endothelium. The endothelium is kind of that covering. And these chemicals disrupt that layer. And as they uncover that layer, they expose the body to all sorts of different chemicals within the body that upregulate factors that accelerate atherosclerosis. Uh, we know that there's a correlation besides diabetes in the setting of thyroid disease, both low states of thyroid, what we call hypothyroidism, and higher states called hyperthyroidism. Um, we're also seeing cognitive dysfunction, you know, changes in terms of brain health and acceleration in diseases like um, Parkinson's disease and things like that. And it's, it's overwhelming every day a new disease is tied into these uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals. The unfortunate part is we have very little guidance in the setting of primary care and from the physician's standpoint in terms of how to deal with this. And this is from a uh, National Academy statement that you can download and it gives us kind of ranges in terms of doing this. So it breaks it down into less than kind of two uh, nanograms per ml, uh, two to 20 and greater than 20. Uh, the unfortunate part is most of the people who have an association with this within the state of Maine have far greater levels than this chart would account for. Um, and it, it talks about, you know, even at levels that are almost undetectable that there are adverse health consequences and adverse health events. Uh, the unfortunate part is in the state of Maine, uh, there are no labs that readily test serum levels of PFAS. Um, the labs that we have used have been out in uh, El Dorado, California. Vista Lab has a very good uh, mechanism for um, going ahead and measuring these. There's an actual bill before the legislature called LD-132 that's been around since, I want to say, 2021. It's this year. Oh. It's new this year. Yeah. I saw the initial, the initial presentation was in 2021. Yeah. And uh, the unfortunate part is um, it's still, I think, held up in committee in terms of going forward to be able to allow uh, uh, labs within the state of Maine to be able to measure serum levels. It needs a mandate review. So, well, let me know. <laughs> Tell me where to show up and I'll be happy to, happy to help that going forward. Um, but really what we're relegated to doing is, is to you know, instead of being a proactive type of situation, we're kind of in a reactive mode of seeing people who have been exposed and trying to deal with the consequences, the downstream medical consequences of what occurs. But there's not um, good science or good data in terms of what to do with these chemicals and how to basically break those chemical bonds and remove them from the system. So we wind up dealing with the downstream health consequences. As you can see, um, in terms of just the disease burden, you know, 56.2%, 
But if you look, and this is just an underestimation of the economic loss from um, the forever, forever chemicals and the, the spark of billions of dollars from that standpoint and the downstream cost of more mortality. Uh, the unfortunate part is um, from the European Union looking at different factors involving this, but you can see that the neurological impacts are overwhelming in terms of the downstream costs. And um, it's just basically the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we're dealing with. You know, as a, um, as a medical community, we don't really have an organized way of, of dealing with people who are affected from this standpoint. And it truly requires more input and more science and more collaboration. And uh, this is really the only advice that we've been given. So individuals just avoid products with PFAS, easily said than done. And you know, to ask our policymakers to limit or ban its use. In terms of health professionals, advise our patients how to avoid PFAS and to support, to support limits on its use. In terms of businesses, to get them to truly phase out PFAS and avoid non-essential uses, and to really work, you know, closely with our policymakers to limit or ban PFAS. You know, from that standpoint, it really doesn't provide a, a granular plan in terms of how to deal with this from a health perspective. And uh, this is, you know, something that Fred had brought to my attention, and has worked really hard to kind of you know, spearhead this through the legislation going forward. So thank you. I actually think I'm gonna stand out behind the podium since I'm short. Also Davis, just FYI, was around for the ozone thing, so I'm feeling a little attacked right now, but other than that. Um, so what's happening here in Maine? Um, so as has been mentioned, the first instance of contamination on farmland was Stone Ridge Farm back in 2016. Um, Fred bravely came forward and told his story, and that uh, started kind of a chain reaction of Maine actually being far out ahead of other states in terms of the work that we're doing on PFAS. Um, so when Governor Mills was elected, she one of the first things that she did was create a PFAS task force, and so she brought together um, all of the agency heads, Department of Environmental Protection, Health and Human Services, Emergency Services, and they sat down and um, kind of looked into what was going on in the state and what needed to be done and put forward some policy recommendations. Um, from our perspective, those policy recommendations probably were not as strong as we would have liked to have seen, but um, it was, they, she was actually, the governor was doing something, the legislature was paying attention. This was a really good step in the right direction. Um, in 2019, um, thanks to the governor's PFAS task force and Fred stepping forward, we were able to work with the legislature and get a ban on PFAS and food packaging here in the state of Maine. Um, food packaging and kind of eating is one of the main sources of exposure to PFAS, and so getting it out of the food package was very important. Um, we became the second state to do that. Washington state was the first. Other states have followed our lead on that issue. Um, in the midst of dealing with trying to ban PFAS and food packaging, there, um, the state, as a result of the task force, had been doing tests on milk across the state because the contamination on Fred's farm showed up in, in milk. They, they set a policy in place to um, do some kind of spot testing of milk in different grocery stores, and if they found high levels of contamination, they would kind of backtrack and figure out where that milk came from. Now, we didn't love that because if you know anything about milk, like it doesn't, when you're buying it in a grocery store, it's not coming from one place. Like it gets dumped in a big vat and mixed up and all of that fun stuff. So the, it, it takes a while to find contamination that way. It's not the best way to do that. But regardless, that's how the state was doing it. And they found a second contaminated farm, Tozier Farm in Fairfield in 2020. Um, and that farm actually, because of where that farm was at, that farm was also contaminated from the land application of sludge or biosolids. But because of the way that Tozier Farm was kind of situated, that sludge like basically ran downhill and contaminated over 300 drinking water wells in Fairfield. So if you've heard about the drinking water issues here in the state of Maine, Fairfield is ground zero for that. And that is because of the, the to be clear, it is not the Tozier's fault. Um, they did not know that there was PFAS in that sludge. Um, 
but that contamination is due to the fact that land, the land application of sludge happened in Tozier, and finding all of those contaminated wells really kind of spearheaded a massive amount of legislation and policy work on a, a bipartisan level that is hard to find these days. Um, so the 130th legislature, which is 2019, 2020, 2021, took a whole bunch of action to try to combat the issue of PFAS here in the state and to find out where the contamination was. So we passed LDU 129. This is a resolve that sets a maximum contaminant level for PFAS in drinking water for six PFAS. It was one of the strictest in the nation at the time. Um, it's 20 parts per trillion for six PFAS. So if you have one PFAS that's 20 parts per trillion, it's or over it's too high, a combination of any of those six over it's too high. And so that needs to be monitored and treated. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we also worked on LD-363. Um, currently, previously the state of Maine had so, uh, stuff in place that said you couldn't sue somebody for damages unless it was within six months of the actual damage happening. So for in Fred's case and other farmers' case, the sludge was done 20 years ago, and they're just now finding the contamination. So that six-month time frame was useless for them to try to get help. So we updated the statute of limitations saying they could sue within six months of finding the contamination, not when the actual contamination happened. Um, we also um, passed LD 1503, which is um, the first in the world piece of legislation that Maine did. And what that does is it is a source reduction bill. And so what LD 1503 does actually is ban all non-essential uses of PFAS for sale in the state by 2030. Um, and so there's also a disclosure, and I'm going through these like number-wise, not um, timeline-wise, but anyway, so LD 1503, first in the world, it requires manufacturers that utilize PFAS in their products to disclose that information to the state. That information will be put in a database. It will be publicly facing. They're in the process of doing it now. So you can go and look at the products that you buy on this database, find out if what you're buying might have PFAS in it, what types of PFAS. And then by 2030, all non-essential uses of PFAS are going to be banned for sale here in the state of Maine. It is in some things that we don't have good alternatives for yet, like some medical supplies. Um, it's used in some electronics, all of this type of stuff. And so the state, the department has a, the authority to kind of define what is necessary. It's the like generic is like for the health, safety, and good of society is the language in the bill. And so they're in the process of doing rulemaking to figure out what they mean by that. Um, so. We're the first state to do that. We're the first country to do that. No other country in the world has done that. Maine is the first and only to ban all non-essential uses of PFAS. It was a huge deal. We're really excited. Industry hates us. It's great. Um, and then uh, we also um, passed a ban on the use of something called AFFF firefighting foam. So for those that don't know, firefighters have higher instances of cancer than the average person. And part of that is because they're exposed to a whole bunch of toxic chemicals through their turnout gear, through the foam that they use to fight like chemical fires. And so we banned the use of PFAS, fire, uh, PFAS containing firefighting foam because there are alternatives. Um, even the DOD finally admitted that there are alternatives and they're moving away from utilizing it. Um, and I would just also like to point out that all of this stuff, 100% bipartisan. The, the state ban on all PFAS substances, under the hammer, no, like we had two senators vote against it. It was 100% bipartisan. And so, and we also passed LD 1600. So because of the Tozier farm contamination, because of the Stone Ridge farm contamination, and because we knew that that contamination came from the spreading of sludge on farmland, that was the map that Davies showed you guys, the, we, the state is now required to they keep track of where, supposedly, they supposedly have all the licenses of where uh, sludge has been spread. Um, and they're supposed to go back to those areas where they have licenses for sludge spreading, test those areas, and find out if there's contamination there. Um, so just because, a, that, the interesting thing about that map that Davy showed though is just because a license was issued does not mean they actually spread the sludge. So while that map is mostly correct, there's probably a few places on there that never actually utilized the license they had. Um, so, they're, they're doing that, they're in the process of doing that contamination rate, or studying that contamination right now. The state, bro or the department of, when I say department, I'm usually talking Department of Environmental Protection. They, they split the state up into like four tiers, 
And so they started with tier one, and that was places where they felt they would have a better chance of finding contamination or there was more of a population or whatever. They had criteria for kind of tiering it. Um, and so what they are finding as they go through um, testing, the, they'll start with the drinking water. If the drinking water is contaminated, then they kind of do concentric circles out to test you know, wells and stuff kind of within that area. And so what they've, they're finding is that we're hitting at about 25 to 30% of contaminated wells as they do the testing. So it's not as bad as we thought, it's still not great. Um, and they're through, halfway through tier one or tier two, they'll start tier three this summer. They can only do the testing during the summer and fall in here because of the frozen ground. So they're in the process of doing that. Um, and so hopefully we'll have much more data about contamination. And so out of that contam out of those studies, if for folks that heard, there were several farms in Fairfield that tested really high for the contamination. Um, we had a uh, songbird farm found massive levels of contamination on their farm. They ended up having to shut down their farm. They moved off their farm. Their blood level levels were on par with somebody that works in a DuPont plant. Um, so this, you know, this stuff is, is not great. So they're in the process of doing that investigation. And then um, we also passed um, LD, uh, 18, well, LD 1875 turned into a study to look at how we could treat landfill leachate. So when you dump stuff in a landfill, they have the liquid that runs off. It's really gross. It's really disgusting. And it's full of na nasty, toxic chemicals. And so, and one of those chemicals is PFAS. And what happens is that leachate goes to a wastewater treatment facility. And that wastewater treatment facility either kind of pumps it back into their sludge. Some of it gets discharged through effluent out into the rivers of Maine. And um, Juniper Ridge Landfill, which is up by the Penobscot Nation, discharges its effluent into the Penobscot River above the tribes and is contaminating their ancestral lands with that PFAS. And so we had a study passed to figure out a way to treat the leachate. And so we're waiting to find out what that's going to look like. And then LD 1911, this is a first in the nation as well. Um, Maine banned the spreading of s sludge on farmland. Um, you might have maybe seen some stories about that recently with um, the Juniper Ridge landfill saying they didn't have the space for it, which I will not comment on that. Um, and so what it did is it means that you can't, spend, you can't spread the sludge on farmland anymore. It is the main source of contamination here in Maine. Um, and so we were like, okay, why would we continue to contaminate our farmland with this stuff? So um, instead of uh, allowing that to be spread on farmland now, now it gets, it gets landfilled. And that was also a first in the, first in the nation. Um, and then because of all of the testing that we were doing and because of all of the farms that we were finding contaminated, because of all these contaminated drinking water wells, um, we needed money. Like folks like Fred, folks like Adam, all of these other farmers that are um, impacted are losing their livelihood. Their health is impacted. It's not their fault. They shouldn't have to pay for it. So... Um, we worked with the legislature last session and got um, $60 million set aside to help PFAS-impacted farmers and well owners. And that money is going to be utilized for research, for farm buybacks, for income replacement, and for some medical monitoring. Um, $60 million sounds like a lot of money, but when you start to do medical monitoring and stuff like that, it's not a lot of money. Um, so we're probably going to have to ask for some more um, once we go through that. They're in the process of working to figure out how to spend that $60 million. Um, and so, but that's, you know, so we took a lot of action the past um, couple of years. We also banned PFAS and pesticides. Um, and so there was, you know, because of the farmland contamination, because of the impact on our rural communities, the Maine legislature, the governor's office, the department have all really stepped up to take action and make sure that we're both doing source reduction through the ban of PFAS and products. We're providing resources to those that are impacted. We're testing and making sure we can find out where the contamination is. Um, and so it's been a whirlwind couple of years to get this all done. No other state has taken as much action as Maine has on this issue. Most other states are not even testing their farmland to see if it's contaminated. So we've had some growing pains, but at the end of the day, we are going to be in a much better place than other states are when it comes right down to it for the safety of our food source, for the health of our um, rural communities, uh, for the health of everybody in Maine if they're not being exposed to PFAS and a whole bunch of products. Um, we're also working on several bills. This session, um, Paul mentioned the blood serum bill. 
That's LD-132. There was a hearing on that a couple of weeks ago. That would require health insurance companies to cover the, post, the cost of B PFAS blood serum testing. Um, the state has to do something called a mandate review to make sure it's not going to cost the state more money to do, do that service. So we're waiting for that to happen. We also um, have a couple of bills to help low-income folks get their well water tested. So right now, currently in the state, if your well is contaminated because of sludge spreading or farmland contamination, the Department of Environmental Protection will pay for your testing and will pay for remediation. But if you have contamination from other source, that does not count to you, and it's expensive. A PFAS test for drinking water runs two to three, $250, $350. I'm looking at my uh, well water expert in the back there. Um, and then remediation can be a few hundred dollars to a few thousand, depending on how expensive it is uh, or how much PFAS you have in your well. So um, we are working on a bill that um, would require the state to cover the cost of testing for low-income Mainers. Um, and that's only for residential wells because public water systems are regulated under the um, MCL bill that we passed, but residential wells are not. Um, so public water systems have all been tested. If you're interested to find out if your public water system, if you're on it, has high levels in it, you can go to the Health and Human Services Drinking Water Program page, and it lists all the towns and what their levels are, along with some schools that were also required to be tested. Um, the MCL bill required testing of all schools and community water systems, or non-community, 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 non-transient water systems that service schools and daycares. So um, if you had a school or a daycare that was on a well, that was also required to be tested. All of that data is on HHS. So anyway, we're hoping that we can get some funding to help low-income Mainers get their wells tested. There is funding under the Maine Housing Authority. If you have PFAS in your well and you are low income for remediation, but there's not currently funding to help you get it tested. And we're also working on some legislation that would require landlords to test if you're renting uh, someplace and it's on um, a residential well. Currently, they're, not, they're only required to test for arsenic. We want to add PFAS and other contaminants to that, so we're working on some legislation there. We also want it to be required if you're buying a home and there's been a PFAS test that that information has been disclosed. Um, and so we're working on that piece of legislation as well to try to make sure that folks, access to clean drinking water is a uh, main part of our mission, and so we want to make sure that um, we can do that. There's also a bunch of bad PFAS bills that are trying to undo all of the good work we've done here in Maine that we're fighting back against. Um, so it's been a very busy, few years up in Augusta around the issue of PFAS. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna, I wanted to make sure folks knew that there were resources out there if they wanted more information. So Maine DEP has a great PFAS page. It has a map of the contamination, kind of has a breakdown of what the state is doing, where you can find that information. There's that sludge map that Davis showed. Um, and then the Department of Health and Human Services kind of has a PFAS and well water fact sheet if you want more information, a PFAS fact sheet and kind of PFAS and public water systems and what they're doing. Um, and so we'll continue to try to push for policies to protect folks from um, PFAS in all kind of areas of life here in the state. Um, if, and I'm just going to point out if folks are interested, we brought kind of a PFAS 101 page over there that just kind of runs down what PFAS is, where you can find it, and then there's a sign-up sheet for our organization if folks are interested in testifying or getting involved in this issue. So with that... Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. It's so informative, alarming. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for coming here today. I can't help but think, where is all of this stuff coming from? The, the sludge that comes from the wastewater treatment plants comes from our drinking water or from our water. So my question is, is this dumping by DuPont? Is this airborne? Things it, I mean, where is it coming from? The manufacturers who are using it, making these six million, the, all these products. Where is it originally getting into the water and therefore into the sludge? Coming from us. Um, every time you wash a nonstick pan that has PFAS on it, that goes down your drain. Every time you wash a jacket that's waterproof. Every time you, if you wear makeup, it is in a ton of makeup. Um, every, you wash your face, it goes down the drain. Um, so while there is contamination from industry, Maine doesn't have a chemical plant. We have some mills, some paper mills, and they have used PFAS, and so there's some contamination from that. There's also some contamination from um, 
uh, the airports because of the AFFF firefighting foam. So Brunswick has a contamination problem because of the airport out there and the and the base. Um, but in terms of where just normal everyday, it's it's in so much stuff that just our normal everyday actions make it end up in our drinking water supplies, end up in our sludge, like everything we wash down the drain. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, so, do I have to use that? Yes. <laughs> okay. So as far as um, research into alternatives for PFAS um, that are, do, do you think that there's, um, some promising research being done as far as uh, getting alternatives to these chemicals that aren't so toxic? I would, yeah. I would say that um, the issue with finding alternatives is it's kind of that, that idea of whack-a-mole right now. These, these things have really unique applications. And what I tried to explain with the six million and all those different products and what they look like is, is that they just find different derivatives of these chemicals. So for example, when I was introduced to the issue of PFAS, when I was living in Wilmington, North Carolina, DuPont was found to be dumping Gen X, which is a, just a name for one of their various PFAS chemicals. That was, that was what I would call a third generation PFAS product that had replaced the product that had replaced PFAS. And it itself had just been found to be just as bad as everything else. So, I would say no. Right now, I don't believe that there's there's really great alternatives. There is some upside. There are a few studies, um, chemical research studies, that have shown that um, specifically things with the sulfonic acid component, that these can be broken down um, with relatively mild reactant conditions. But you know, these are really early studies. These are things that are just done in the lab. You know, it's hard to know if you can apply these things at scale and if they work, you know, on all of them or if they work uh, out in the environment. Yeah. So. The one thing I want to add to that is that Maine's definition of PFAS is one of the strictest in the nation, and there's a reason for that. Um, 17 other states use the same definition that we do. The federal government does not. We picked that one carbon fluorine bond for a reason to try to keep from doing the whack-a-mole thing. Um, like there was a method to our madness when we drafted that legislation. There are some alternatives for specific things, but it's, you know, it is, like you said, it's, it's, it's tough. But part of the reason why states are looking to set that definition for PFAS so strict is because that definition covers most of the, you know, most of the PFAS that are in use um, fall under that kind of one carbon fluorine bond thing. Um, and so we, you know, we're trying to make it so that they can't do the whack-a-mole thing with the Gen X um, and other things that they've been doing because that's all they do. All those, all the chemical companies do are like, we're just going to tweak it a little bit. And the other thing, just I can get on my soapbox about how we approve chemicals in this country, but the way that we approve, you know, new chemicals in the in from the EPA is absolutely ludicrous, and we basically just take industry's word that they're safe. So. Um, I just had a quick question for Dr. Siegel. Do I have to press something? Okay. Um, do you think that in the future, for us Mainers, especially hoping to practice primary care or internal medicine in Maine, would it be advisable once we do have a sufficient source to send blood samples to to detect PFAS? Should we be looking at more at-risk populations like our farmers, even right now? Um, there was a previous CC event on the main fishing and lobstering in industry just talking about how little support they have from our government um, health-wise, both um, just in their routine primary care visits, but then also for mental health, and that our farmers actually have more. I don't really know what that means per se, but um, what should we do as far as sort of stratifying this? Because to your point, the risk is broad. I mean, all of us are clearly consuming this, and we can do the best that we can to mitigate our risk, but um, other th hopefully than just living in Maine, where things are hopefully going to get better. But um, what kind of ideas do you have about that? Yeah, Ellie, I think that's a great question. And, you know, the unfortunate part is with any disease, you have to measure it. Because if you don't measure it, you just don't know, you know, where you are. You know, the chemical decay of these compounds is years. You know, it's, 
it's lifetimes of people. And I think that's the biggest problem. So I think measuring them, having an acceptable way of measuring them, and then being able to collaboratively, you know, and this is not something that just medicine can do by itself. We need Davis, we need Sarah, we need, a, it, this has to be a collaborative process to go ahead and, and target this and to be able to come up with metrics and then to be able to figure out how to manage these things. So it requires, you know, active capabilities of being able to, you know, if you have the capabilities of chelating something, of being able to take a chemical and bind it and make it from a toxic standpoint to a non-toxic standpoint. So I think we're going to have to do that. And the first step is being able to measure things. Then we have an idea as to what it actually means. You know, because right now those, those guidelines that I proposed are not, I must admit, is, is not very useful from the standpoint of a physician or anyone in primary care. So. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. Um, my name is Mike Sheldon. I work in the provost office here at UNE. Um, so my question is, um, for a take home tonight, <clears throat> if you were to say, you know, you're struggling, what, what, can, what can we get, share with my patients and so forth? <clears throat> if there's a filter mechanism, which may not be 100% effective, you know, there's the portable ones you can get at a store, like the Brita thing, you get a re reverse osmosis filter. So I come from a part of <clears throat> Maine when I first moved here, I live in North Saco, we became aware of the arsenic problem, right? We never tested for arsenic. My neighbors lived there for, you know, generations without knowing that that was there, have high arsenic levels, it's never gonna go away. So we invested in a system which is fairly expensive to be able to mitigate that problem. So I'm just, quite, you know, to, because you never know, you have to keep testing year after year, right? It's, it's not like you test once and don't know forever. And I think some of the issues, as I understand it, related to PFAS can also come from rain, rainwater and sort of the acidification of lakes and so forth and everything moving from west, west to east. So I'm just kind of like that practical take home thing. Would any of those mitigation measures, maybe not totally mitigate, but Yes, there's definitely practical things you do. And then if there are, with related to the portable filters, what do you do when you're done with those, right? Because those have to go somewhere as well when you're, you know, if you use the charcoal-based filter. So anyway, I'll stop there. and Just interested in any thoughts you have on that. So charcoal filters and reverse osmosis do treat drinking water for PFAS. Um, so you can, um, where is Sergio? Brita filters, no? Brita filters? Okay, sorry, this is my well water testing expert guy back here. Uh, um, so you can, tr you can treat your drinking water, reverse osmosis, charcoal filters, all of that stuff that you use to treat for arsenic will treat for PFAS. I mean, you want to test because your levels could be incredibly high and you might need a more sophisticated system than a Brita filter or just a basic thing that's, testing, that's working for your arsenic. But you hit up the nail on the head is that those filters have to be changed. Where do they go? They have to go to a landfill. Um, and so then you're just dealing with the leachate and the effluent and all of that type of stuff. And, you know, we're working to figure out ways to treat the leachate that we passed another piece of legislation uh, or part of one of these legislations that we passed is requiring every place that discharges effluent into a river or a waterway here in the state of Maine to test and see how much PFAS is ending up in our streams and stuff. But we don't have a standard for that. So we need the data to set the standard. But you can, you can, you can treat, you can drink water. There's also things you can do that are not water-based. Get rid of your, I mean, don't just toss them in the street, but, you know, landfill your um, nonstick pans and buy cast iron. Um, if you wear makeup, don't buy anything waterproof. Um, if you, Patagonia, L.L. Bean, REI, all of these companies have made commitments to move away from PFAS in their outerwear, I, um, by t most of them by 2025. California actually passed legislation that is banning PFAS in textiles and clothing by 2025 and extreme outerwear by 2028. And because California, like that's the lo fourth largest economy in the world, everybody's just gonna have to adjust. So it's, it, folks are starting to do stuff. So there, there is things that you can do if you can possibly buy something that's not, like I put new carpet in my house. Nobody needs stain resistant carpet, I'm sorry. Um, you just don't. I have three cats, I don't have stain resistant carpet, it's totally fine. Um, so, you know, anything that, that they're like, should we coat this for you or make the stain resistant, agree? just say no. So there are things that you can do, like, but it's also, at the end of the day, not up, much like the climate crisis, 
It is not up to every one single individual to do that. Companies need to be responsible here and do the right thing, and they're just not doing that. So at the end of the day, we need DuPont and 3M and K-Mores to actually stop making crap that poisons us. Um, the state also, by the way, is suing them right now to try to get um, money back to re re reimburse the state for all the work that they're doing. But anyway, I will get off my soapbox. There are things that you can do. Try to stay away from you know anything that's grease resistant, water resistant, stain resistant. Whole Foods has moved away from PFAS in their food packaging. Burger King has. I don't think McDonald's has yet. But they're like all of these places are taking these steps because they realize it's a big deal. So there is action. I don't want people to walk out of here like with doom and gloom. So there is things that you can do, and there are things happening. You know, and Mike, the other thing I would mention is just source control. That's the hardest part, is being able to figure out within your day-to-day -day activities what is your prime source and to try and mitigate that. You know, I, I don't think everyone has the capabilities of putting in a, rever a reverse osmosis unit. They're expensive. You know, having run multiple dialysis units, we have a you know, uh, $250,000 reverse osmosis, nothing gets through there. So it's a great place to fill your fish tank. So, <laughs> so. And if folks have residential wells and are interested in figuring out how to test them, I'm gonna once again put my colleague Sergio in the back of the room on the spot. Um, we can help provide you information on how to do that. So since you have not, if you said you didn't test for, I don't know if you've done it yet, but we're gonna seriously encourage you to test your residential well. I'm just a little curious. Uh, is there a direct pathway for infants and nursing mothers through their breast milk? And if so, d is there higher levels of PFAs in infants? And is that a concern for our increased health risk for infants? So these chemicals do cross the placenta. So there would make it in terms of that. I've not seen a study that kind of correlates, you know, from that. T okay. So Sarah may know in terms of that part of things. There, there was a there has been breast milk studies um, actually, uh, and yes, that is a po an exposure pathway for infants. Um, so Adam Nordell, who owns Songbird Farm, he and his wife have a child, and Adam and his wife have massive levels of PFAS in their blood. His wife's is lower because she breastfed. Um, so that it, but having said that, they are still saying that breast milk is still the healthiest because there are other ways of exposure through it. But there is a direct exposure from breast milk. Yes. Um, you might have answered this already, but I take a minute to process. Um, how do you calculate the amount of PFAS coming from farms in Maine? Like, do you? Is there like an average amount coming from farms? N no? I don't know. <laughs> Fred's okay. laughing. Um, there's not an average amount. It just kind of, PFAS is such an interesting chemical in that um, Adam, so Songbird Farm, hadn't spread PFAS or hadn't spread sludge on their farm for like 20 or 30 years, had massive levels, had a farm next door, did the same thing, not nearly as bad. It's, it's such a, it's highly mobile, it moves around a lot, it, it, so, but, so there's not one specific level and the state has not, the state is in the process of doing research to try to figure out kind of safe levels. Um, so, but they don't, and they have not, they've set them for some things, so like milk is 210, um, although that's too high because it's set based on the EPA's drinking water standard, which is too high. Um, they've set it for beef, they've set it for chickens, and, and what they're also finding is that for some odd reason, it pulls up into leafy greens easier than it does into like fruits. So if you have a tomato plant, you might find it in the leaves, but it wouldn't be as much in the tomato. But if you grow kale or lettuce, um, in PFAS contaminated land, it, it shows up in that stuff m in much higher levels. So they're trying to figure out why that is. And part of that research is to look to see how they can help the farmers with the impacted land pivot to maybe growing something else that is not, that does not uptake the PFAS as much. So, but in terms of like actual level set, they, there's not really like, it's not an average, like every part of Maine is different. Yeah, and, and Fred, Fred wants to chime in here really quick. <laughs> yeah, don't give me a microphone. Don't get you know. Don't get me started. Um, <coughs> the, the state's number for um, 
for land, okay, you know, if you're gonna if you're gonna grow crops and you know, and acquire forage land, okay, so we're growing crops and we and the the hay forage is going up into the and then that's what we use for hay and that's what we use to feed our cows and cows for us produce milk, okay. So the state's number for land is um, um, six point um, yeah, I was gonna get that number wrong. Six point eight, okay. So any now my hot field is just under a million, just so you know. And the last time we did any sludge burning on our fields was in 04. All right, so that kind of gives you an idea when they talk about forever chemicals, that's what they mean by that forever chemicals. For, um, 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 for beef, the number is uh, 3 point, uh, I think it's 3.4. That's in the muscle. Now, there, now the thing that I can tell you is that cows will shed this. Uh, especially young cows under five years of age, and they do it through urination and milk production. Again, when Sarah mentioned that um, and Adam Nadell's um, wife, who had the infant, um, her numbers went down. That's why it went down. It's through milk production, and it, it because she was breastfeeding. Although I would probably would might take a, a, you know advantage about not doing that, you know, feeding it to your infant. The thing that we ran into with our kids is like my blood level is 111. Yours should be two or four. My wife's number is 91. My daughter and my sons are just under 50, but they are impacted more for it, more uh, by it because they were in infected or poisoned, if you like to really piss people off. That's what you use, the term you use, uh, when they were adolescents as opposed to when they were adults. Now we did sludge spreading from uh, 83 until 04, so <coughs> that's why when they call it a forever chemical, that's what they mean by that. But there is a way to, to get cows to clean up. Now, uh, Mr. Uh, <laughs> Siegel, he's smiling over there, well, might tell you that cows and people are not the same, but I will tell you that there they, we have a lot of similarities. And except for uh, being able to dispose of PFAS, I'll probably die with the numbers that I have. But with cows, you can get them to clean up. And my number, if there is a number out there, and I know s the, the number for milk is supposed to be, probably be, would be 42, but that would be based on the state's number of 20. And um, that's what they're basing the other numbers on. EPA's recommended number is 0 .06 combined. They went from 70 to 0 .06 combined. They announced that when we were in Wilmington. At the I never knew I could sweat so much till I was in Wilmington, by the way. <laughs> um, and I spoke at that conference. Uh, but uh, in all honesty, I, you know, we I say we had to laugh or cry, and I ran out of tears a long time ago. But um, and if you really want to know what it costs to have a moral conscience, I think mine's from point one point five. Yeah, counting. And, counting. And, four and, a half all the time. and we appreciate you standing up, Fred. <laughs> oh, sorry, Fred. No, 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 no. I didn't mean to take it away from you. You're still saying. But the other thing, just in terms of the cow thing, the chickens, also my understanding is that if you can get a chicken off of contaminated land, it's like a week or two until the eggs are clear. So it's different for each, you know, each thing. The other thing I would say is that um, for some reason, tomatoes and potatoes seem to be somewhat resistant to PFAS. So, and it's interesting, you know, I mean, in terms of the reading, I don't really understand the reason behind it but tomatoes and potatoes seem to be resistant to PFAS. So. Mr. Siegel, I have, so yes, sorry. I'm okay. I have a question um, about BPA, um, also an endocrine disrupting chemical. Would you say um, more impactful than PFAS or less? Because we see BPA-free everything now, right? And so the question medically goes to you first and then maybe to Sarah in terms of like how difficult or easy was it to pass legislation ar around BPA as compared to PFAS? Um, from the literature read, I would say that PFAS is probably worse as an endocrine disrupting even though um, uh, bisphenol A is within that same category. But I would say that probably the links in terms of endocrine-based diseases is probably stronger for PFOS and PFAS, so. I don't know about the legislation part of things, so I'm gonna leave that for you. Um, I didn't work on um, some of the, of the BPA stuff. Um, I think in here in Maine, it probably was a little easier for the PFAS stuff because we had so many impacted communities. Um, you know, going back to Fred and Adam, when we had the testimony about the source reduction bills and the banning of sludge spreading, 
and you know, all of these impacted farmers are coming in and telling their stories, and we have committee members crying in the committee because it's just so awful, like it's hard for them to say that we shouldn't do something like this. Um, but I will also say that you see a lot of stuff that says PFAS free or PFOS free or PFOA free. If it says something like that, it's not PFAS free. It just means it doesn't have those like two chemicals. So when you're, you know, and same with BPA, like there are still BPA used in a lot of stuff. So when they say BPA free, what type of BPA are they talking about? So, I mean, there's not always truth in advertising for some of this stuff. Um, so they can say something is BPA free because they're talking about maybe two types of BPA or whatever. Um, and the same with PFAS. There's been a lot of stuff that says PFAS free, but what they really mean <coughs> is PFOA and PFOS free because they're not defining PFAS how we define PFAS. Um, so, uh, yeah. So. And the other part of that is um, a lot of the movement of BPA came not from farmers, but came from people who had a lot of pull. You know, people in industry, people in, you know, um, uh, television, stuff like that. So it was more popularized than that, and they have much more pull than Fred Stone. So, unfortunately. That's the worst part about it. Thank you. I have a, a question for Sarah. Uh, you mentioned LD uh, 1911 prohibited uh, distributing sludge to land yes. and created uh, landfill requirements. So it, it didn't rec it didn't create a landfill requirement. It just said you couldn't spread it on farmland. But there's not really much else to do with it. Um, landfilling is the best of a bunch of bad options. Okay. Um, so so it's it's it, it, they're not like. The, le the, le the bill does not say must be landfilled. It just says you can't spread it on farmland, but there's not really, there's not really much else you can do with it. Okay, um, so that, that goes to the second question was, did the state mandate landfill sites? Uh, they didn't. They did not. So the state owns Juniper Ridge Landfill, um, which is up, um, like I said, in Old Town. That is a state-owned landfill. It is run by Casella. Um, which is a multi-billion dollar corporation, mm -hmm. um, but the state actually owns it. So when we were working on the legislation, the state said that there was enough space in that landfill to manage the increase in sludge. And the one thing I will say that people don't talk about is that before we full on banned sludge spreading in Maine, the DEP actually set standards for PFOA and PFOS and sludge. And over 95% of the state's sludge tested above the standard. So long before we full out banned it, most of it was already being landfilled. The problem was is that what was happening is that some of the stuff that was going up to Casella, they were taking to their Hawkeridge facility and saying it was compost. Um, they weren't actually adding anything to it to make it compost. They were just mixing it up and throwing it in a bag and saying it was compost. So folks were still spreading the contaminated sludge on their farmland. It just came out of a bag instead of out of a farm truck. And so LD 1911 was originally supposed to just close that loophole, but because of all the contamination, the committee decided to amend the bill and make it a full out ban. But even before they did that, the levels in, in our sludge in our state were so high that most of it was already having to be landfilled. Okay, and then hopefully my last question. Um, is the state currently accepting sludge from out of state? No. Okay. No, we are unfortunately shipping our sludge out of state. So I will say that the Hawksridge facility, which is not state run, that is once again Casella, um, they are accepting out of state to make their compost to sell. They cannot sell it in Maine because it has PFAS sludge in it, but they can make it and send it to other places and sell it. Um, you know, so they are, we are exporting our PFAS contamination to Canada and to down south, so. Hi, thank you all for a great presentation. Um, my name is Samantha Shuljoth. I'm actually a former UNE student, and I'm currently a postdoctoral research associate at Boston University. I actually just wanted to mention, in terms of the lactation question, that not only is lactation a route of elimination for the mothers and exposure for the children, there are actually a handful of studies that have now shown that PFAS may actually impact the mammary gland development. And so there are studies showing that PFAS is associated with um, risk of non-initiation as well as shorter term of breastfeeding duration. So it's sort of a two-pronged thing there. Um, Sarah, my question is actually for you though. So 
we have these MCLs that are based on the sum of the PFAS, which is great because we're trying to get at this cumulative exposure. But there are now studies showing that these PFAS have interactive effects for certain health outcomes with each other, but also with other persistent EDCs. And I'm just curious if you've thought or if there's conversations around how you actually deal with that in terms of policy and that it may not be as simple as just summing together these PFAS chemicals. So the state has not, and I'm, you know, once again, master's degree in political science, so if you need a, might, maybe one of these guys might be able to chime in and may, give a much smarter answer than I do. The federal government, however, um, is, so main standard is 20 parts per trillion for six PFAS. The EPA just released their um, draft rules for drinking water standards, and they are of magnitude lower than what Maine has right now. Um, it's four parts per trillion for PFOA and PFOS, and then they are doing a health assess uh, hazard assessment for four others. Um, and that is beyond my non-scientific brain to know how that is going to work, but they are kind of assessing each of those six PFAS a little based on various risk assessments and stuff like that and kind of looking at it from that perspective. I don't know if that answers your question and maybe one of the scientists actually has a better. No. <laughs> well, then I feel a little bit better about myself about that. But, but yeah, there. So the, and the and the interesting thing is that Maine has, the federal government is regulating six PFAS in drinking water. We regulated six, but they don't they don't match. So once the federal government standards go into effect, Maine will actually be um, regulating eight PFAS in drinking water um, as opposed to six in most other places. So. So this is a question for Davis. Um, Davis, when was the first PFAS substance created by the chemical industry? I imagine it was a long time ago. And so follow up to that is PFAS, these have been in our environment for decades, decades and decades. What explains the lag time between their presence in the environment and uh, being able to detect them at these levels that is so recent, 2015, 2016. What, what, uh, what is key to explaining why there is such a lag time there? And also a lag time in the detection or noticing of various uh, diseases, disease loading that can be tied directly to these chemicals. Again, if, we've, if they've been around for so long, how come there's been such, so many years for us to become so concerned about it, rightly so? and also so many years for us to be able to see this show up in human disease. Uh, going to the first part of your question, I believe PFAS came online in the 1920s. They were um, completely by accident. Um, I, remember, I can't remember the scientist's name, but... Um, it was an experiment completely by accident. It was a cylinder of gas that he had pumped fluorine gas into with whatever reactants he had in there. He noticed that there was no pressure in the tank the day later, but he noticed that the, the weight remained the same, so he figured there had to be something inside of it. And um, he had inadvertently created the first perfluorinated alkyl substance, and it was a white powder. Um, and I don't think they had a lot of uses in the first couple of years, but as soon as the World War II kicked off, that was when they figured out, oh man, we can really use these things for a lot of stuff, mostly as a fire retardant in planes um, during aerial combat. And to the second part of your question, why, why did it take so long to detect these things? Um, I think it's kind of a two-pronged answer. Um, one is that these things aren't very reactive. So in order to detect something, you have to interact with it. Um, you have to have a viable way to interact with it. Um, today, we have great technology. We have time of flight mass spec. We can measure things down to you know where it's like individual atoms as a concentration. We didn't have that before, especially when we started dumping these things in the 80s on Fred's farm. Um, we just didn't have that kind of detectability. And um, combine a low measurement ability with a um, very unreactive molecule, it, it takes a long time to find it. I think the other perspective from, um, from a medicine perspective is this kind of mirrors other exposures that we've had throughout the United States, whether it's Agent Orange, in terms of the lag, in terms of doing that. You have to identify, you have to be able to accurately measure 
And then you have to look at the downstream consequences and you need someone who brings it to someone's attention. And that's the biggest problem. But that Gulf War syndrome, I mean, all these other things that have been exposures over time, you know, have had downstream consequences. But to really be able to tease diabetes away from PFAS would be impossible because, you know, the, it, just the parallel in terms of diabetes increasing over time, it's astronomical. It's actually at a linear fashion, which is really disturbing for, you know, medicine and medicine's capabilities. So I think that's the other part of it is, is someone has to bring it to someone's attention. And someone has to kind of beat the drum in that regard. That doesn't happen. You know, sometimes people are not willing to do that. So if you're really interested, there's a really good documentary called The Devil You Know um, that kind of goes into the history of PFAS. Um, you won't feel great after you watch it. Uh, it's super depressing, um, but it's really interesting. And also, um, Mark Ruffalo and Anne Hathaway did a movie a few years ago um, called Dark Waters, which was about um, DuPont poisoning, um, not North Carolina this time, but West Virginia. Um, and an entire community there who had massive health impacts because they were kind of hiding the health impacts. So if you're, that is a little less, uh, it's still, it's a little less depressing than the documentary because it's a Hollywood thing and like somebody wins at the end, a lawsuit and what up. So, um, but it's still, it still has a good history of it. So if you're interested at all in learning more about either one of those, those are both good kind of resources. So I just want to say a huge thank you to our three amazing panelists um, for sharing their expertise. We're really grateful that you could join us and that you took the time um, to be here with us and, and share with us. Um, audience members, if you have more questions or thoughts that you want to share, please feel free to contact the participant or the panelists directly. Um, they'd love to hear from you and their contact information is, is above. And um, to anyone um, in the audience, before you leave today, please um, fill out this brief attendance survey. There's a QR code so you can snap it with your phone and do it um, on your phone. Um, we deeply value your feedback, which we will use to inform our future events. Um, and as Pam said earlier, um, we are looking to do a part two of this in the fall semester. We're hoping that Fred will join us as a panelist that time. So you'll get a microphone of your own. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, so, and just also as a reminder um, to our students, today's event addressed interprofessional competencies of values and ethics and roles and responsibilities and can be applied toward your um, interprofessional honors distinction application. So many thanks again to amazing partners, the School of Marine and Environmental Programs, Earth's Eco, thank you very much, Jasmine and Virginia. Um, and the Center for Excellence in Collaborative Education, as well as our UNE communications team. Without all of you, this event would not have been possible. So a big thank you um, to the audience for joining us. Um, PFAS contamination of our soil and water is just one of many issues that really uniquely illustrates the interdependence of human health um, on our environment. It's only, as, as all of our panelists have mentioned, it's only when we unite across disciplines to discuss and grapple with these critical issues together that we have um, any, uh, the greatest potential for, for solving them. So thank you very much. And just one, one more Oops. plug, if you want to at all get engaged in any of the legislation we're working on, we have a sign-up sheet and we'd love to have you. Thank you.